Hi, welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all the time. Puddles and I are here in Chicago, Illinois, again at the beautiful home of Mr. Charles Shookett. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. Um, with an avid Tuba People TV viewer, Mr. Joe Allman. Joe, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Joe has watched every single Tuba People TV episode that's been posted to date. And today is, what is today? July 14th, 2016. Mm -hmm. So congratulations and thank, thank you. you for your, uh, <laughs> thank you for your loyal viewership. They're all great. Puddle well, says you're number one. Oh, fantastic, I appreciate that. Anyway, um, so Joe has watched all these videos and uh, he um, emailed me and asked if he could ask some questions. And since we're all in Chicago for the Mike Becker Low Brass Boot Camp, we thought we'd just put them on video. So Joe, fire away. Well, um, I, I first want to ask how you got into music as a young person and how you got to tuba all before, you know, Northwestern ever happened for you. Uh, the short answer is Hogan's Heroes. <clears throat> the theme song to Hogan's Heroes attracted me to music. And then uh, my band director in high school handed me a tuba and said, take this home and see what you can do with it And uh, over the summer. And so I did. I was, I was going to be, you know, I was laboring away on the trombone, and that's, mm. that's what I wanted to do. But then I heard Toby Hanks, the fall of 1977, with the New York Brass Quintet, play the tuba, and I put the trombone down. Uh, oh, well. The tuba was it. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, th there's uh, several people who are famous brass players who claim to have wanted to start out on trombone and went to a, a different instrument for various reasons. So yeah, I, it's too bad. It, it was <laughs> a labor. Trombonist. It was a labor of labor. The trombone for me. Very it wasn't good. a labor of love. Okay. So how did how did you choose Northwestern as a school? And and did you know who Arnold Jacobs was before you? So uh, and my high school band director said, if you ever want to make it big in your hometown, then you have to leave your hometown and go elsewhere and then come back. And the reason is that if you go somewhere else, then when you come back, people think you've acquired some sort of secret sauce. And you, right. have, the, you have the special voodoo recipe and you know what's really real and you're not just one of us. Right. And uh, so I always had it in my mind that I needed to go somewhere. I didn't ever want to leave Portland. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. But um, I knew that if I wanted to make it big in Portland, that I was going to have to go somewhere else. So one of my high school um, classmates, trombonist, went to Northwestern. And he was studying with Mr. Chris Apulli, mm -hmm. And we would, we would write letters back and forth. We actually wrote letters, like real letters. How about that? Put them in an envelope, a stamp, and everything. And he would tell me about Northwestern, and Mr. Chris Apulli, and the Chicago Symphony. And all these kinds of things and said you should come here so I said well I'm gonna to apply to Northwestern so um, I was in the middle of junior college at the time and I thought okay I gotta get myself in a launching pad so I went to from junior college to Portland State University mm -hmm. and um, uh, and then transferred to Northwestern I, see. I didn't know anything about mr. Jacobs in fact in my in my Northwestern audition that was held in Tacoma back then I don't know if they still do it now but back then the admissions director from Northwestern music school would go around the country with a tape recorder. You know, go to LA, San Francisco, Seattle, you know, the, the mm -hmm. East Coast, East Coast towns. Okay. And you'd play for the tape recorder and, and then he'd take the tape recorder, the, the tapes back to the various studio faculty and they would evaluate them. So I went to Tacoma Stadium High School in Tacoma and I played my audition. He said, very good. Now you know our tuba, tuba professor is Bob Rusk. And I said, yes, I knew that because I'd read the material, uh, the catalog. And I just, he said, I just want to make clear that Arnold Jacobs is not teaching tuba at Northwestern. And I said, who's Arnold Jacobs? And he said, that's perfect. That's all I want to hear. And so I got accepted. And when I, the summer before I left, um, one of my friends in Portland, one of my trombone player friends, another friend, he told me about Arnold Jacobs. Uh, really? So it was, it was pretty much, I just fell into Jake's studio without any hmm. 
I mean, provocation on my part. Must be some guiding hand at work. Definitely. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. Would you care to describe what <laughs> studying the tuba and music prior to Northwestern was like, in contrast to, you know, the well-known philosophies of Jacobs, yeah. if you would care to. Yeah, I mean, it was very complicated. It was very vexing. It was very confusing. I always had lots of questions, and mm -hmm. I was all, you know, I couldn't figure out what am I supposed to do, because I was uh, the pedagogy at the time, and my teachers were not being dishonest or anything. It was, that's the way, that was the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. That was the way, you know? And so they were very dutiful in, in presenting to me what they knew, and I'm grateful for it. And I had some success with it, you know. I mean, I got in, I got into Northwestern, so there must have been something going on. But it was, you know, you know, telling me to manipulate my tongue and, you know, make it okay. You gotta have, you know, like two centimeters behind to, to articulate. You gotta have your tongue two centimeters behind, behind your front teeth. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to figure out, well, where is two centimeters in my mouth, or you know, where my tongue is, and and these types of things. I had to keep my shoulders down. Mm. I had to keep my sternum down. I had to keep my tight, my gut tight. Take a breath, now blow, this, this type of thing. And so it was difficult to really have a success. It was a, it was a difficult path to mm -hmm. success. It, people do it, it's just not as easy as the, I think, as the Jacobs pedagogy. So Jake must have been, uh, Mr. Jacobs, must have been like just radically different in terms of approach. Oh, yeah, I mean, Mr. Jacobs was... 180. And and was it is it was it strange to you at first or was it? Well, I'm sure it was strange, but was it a welcomed strange? Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, my my first audition or my first experience with Mr. Jacobs in person was my civic audition mm -hmm. in the fall of '81, and um, first thing I had to play was the Meister Singer solo, and I had a very a very um, pronounced double vibration problem from D in the staff to G at the bottom of the staff. Well, the first three notes of the Meister Singer solo fell um, fall um. right into that range, and so I was having some double bi double vibration issues, and so he uh, uh, within 30 seconds the audition was over and the first lesson began, and he worked with me for 10 minutes, uh -huh. 15 minutes, and said, "Just call me up and uh, I'll get you into the studio." Uh, okay. Yeah, and so that fall though, as it turned out. They brought Jacobs back onto the faculty at Northwestern. So my, my fall, my first my first fall at Northwestern, he came back. Wow. And so he and Bob Rusk were the mm -hmm. the two tuba teachers. And then the following year, they they dismissed Bob, and and had Jacobs do the whole thing. That's amazing. Well, the timing was right. I it mean, was, I guess, I guess, for you. So was that civic audition just a private audition for no. Jake? Oh, I mean, it, yeah. It or was, was it official like? 20 guys, gals behind a screen. Oh yeah, I and mean, the Jacobs audition for Civic was, it was, there's Mr. Jacobs, there's you. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it was It was definitely different than it is today. Indeed, for, for sure. Yes, yeah. yeah, okay. No videos, Yeah. you know, no live videos or anything like that. It was just live and in person. So what were some of the primary things that he helped you with? It's pretty simple. Um, you know, he helped to put a song in my head because when I went to him, I was I had been taught to be so uh, analytical about what I was doing with my body that I wasn't thinking about the music at all. I certainly wasn't hearing music in my mind, and um, so he he got me to start thinking about the music, to imagine the music, to hear the music, um, to be able to sing the music, you know, mm -hmm. pitch wise, oral skills type things, um, and then he got me to just uh, you know relax and put much more wind at the lips and and he gave me permission to move my sternum and my, my shoulders didn't have to be you know way down like that right. we don't there's not we don't want that because that's tension but they could run you know when your sternum goes up reactionary so the, yeah reactionary exactly yeah. so um, just taking in much more air because I was definitely just a half breather mm -hmm. I, I was always out of breath yeah. seemingly and uh, so he got me to realize what was a full breath he got to me really got through got me to realize that I was only taking half a breath in and I had all this more air to, to, to use. Did, didn't you mention to me a few years ago that you also had very little experience buzzing on the mouthpiece? Oh sure. Oh I mean I didn't buzz the mouthpiece at all yeah. before I went to Jacobs and 
I was really bad at it. You know, he 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 of course uh, encouraged me to, to buzz the mouthpiece um, and the mouthpiece rim. I was very very. It was it was bad. I, I resisted it really for my first six or seven months probably with him, because I had so little success. I mean, it was just it was not fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't good. Uh, I didn't sound good. It didn't feel good. I just didn't like it. Um, but he was patient with me yeah. and kept gently insisting or encouraging mm -hmm. for me to just play melodies on the mouthpiece. And uh, eventually that started to started to take and once it did, wow, the, uh, the improvement in quality of sound, mm -hmm. you know, pitch, endurance, yeah. all these things really started to come alive, as well as the sound of my mind. Along the buzzing lines, he advocated that you do melodies primarily, just like what I understand he advocated yeah. for most people, rather than drills. Yeah, I think later, when I, by the time I encountered him in 81, he had, I think he had more or less gone away from the drill form of mouthpiece buzzing. It's not to say that he wouldn't from time to time if he thought it was appropriate for a student, um, if that's what a, a particular student would benefit the most from. But uh, the majority of my instruction from him was, was melodic mouthpiece buzzing, and then also just if there's a passage that was giving me trouble in a, in a piece. You know, the, the, the order, if, if you can't play it on the horn, buzz it. If you can't buzz it, sing it. Mm -hmm. If you can't sing it, learn to sing it. Once you've learned to sing it, take it back to the mouthpiece, and then take it back to the horn. Were you comfortable with singing? Oh, no, I mean, I, I was a terrible, at, I had terrible pitch. Okay. I was in RL skills every single quarter of every single year I was in college. Mm. Did he ever advocate uh, choir? He, tell you to sign he up didn't tell me to sign up for choir, okay. but he, I know that he, he did know, yeah. others, yeah. Okay. But um, it, it all began to kind of come together in terms of, of uh, pitch and, and yeah. that sort of thing, Great. Inner, inner ear things. Mm -hmm. So were you able to um, see Mr. Jacobs with any sort of frequency after Northwestern for lessons? Oh yeah, uh, so when I won the, my job down in Savannah Symphony, um, Savannah's only a thousand miles away from Chicago, so when there was a, when there was a, a week of Beethoven or something along those lines, okay. Then I would hop in my car and, and drive to Chicago. I'd make it in about 13 or 14 hours. It's pretty good. Straight driving from Savannah to Chicago. Get a lesson the next day and then hop. I try to get an early lesson, like maybe the first lesson, 11 o'clock or something like that, on a Saturday, and then hop in the car and, and drive back to Savannah. It seems like. Uh, and I would do that several times a year. Uh huh. Seems like a lot of former uh, Northwestern students of his are consistent students of his while people were in Chicago frequently or mm -hmm. lived here kept seeing him as often as they could until he was no longer with us yeah that seems like a common theme it is I think there's there are a lot of people that did that and, and I think so you'd also, say you're one of them oh yeah the, I was one of 98 yeah and, and uh, if, if if I couldn't see him in person some, some uh, with some in some particular period of time I, I would call them yeah if I was having a problem or if I needed a suggestion, or uh, if if I was particularly vexed with a student, you know, mm -hmm. if it was a student issue that I didn't really know how to how to handle, I would call him up and explain the situation. He would he would kibitz with me over the phone and give me right. give me some suggestions that invariably worked. Yeah, I, I recall you saying you've had mo you know many conversations with him over the phone that really yeah. helped. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people did mm -hmm. for sure. So after you had won your job in Savannah and you continued seeing him for lessons whenever you could, mm -hmm. did those lessons take on a different focus for you? Did the subject matter of those change? You know, I think as far as his, um, I, when I first encountered him, his nomenclature was definitely um, wind and song. And I think by the time I was in Savannah in the late 80s, uh, I was coming back to him in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. um, it switched to song and wind. Okay. Also in the 90s, my exp my remembrance is that he, for me anyway, he we didn't use as many of the gadgets that we did early on in uh, in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And it could be just because I didn't need them anymore. I'm not sure. It could be that he was trying to get away from them. I know other people that I've interviewed have thought that maybe he was 
um, trying to keep it simple, and he saw that uh, the, perhaps that the gadgets were becoming the focus. They were becoming the means, not not you know, or the end instead of the means. Right. And uh, uh, and that was of course not what he what he was about. Um, it was always about the music for him, not the gadgets. Um, so the music should, should be the focus, not the gadgets. So it could be that he was sensitive to that. I don't really. He never said anything that I remember anyway about that. But my sense is that he maybe he was moving in that in that direction. Okay. Okay. Did, did you have conversations with him about teaching other students, like how you would he would fix a problem that you're encountering with a student? Oh, with my students? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely, for sure. Okay. Uh, and did that change, like mm, type of advice he would give? No, usually, usually the, uh, the advice that he would give me for. Um, a student of, of mine that I was having a difficult time figuring out an issue, how to solve it. It was there was usually some sort of distractionary result. Um, for instance, in one particular case, um, there was a student who was having a hard time um, get above the staff, um, and uh, on a consistent basis, mm -hmm. the student could from time to time get above the staff. So that showed me that. Possible. It's possible, you know. There's yeah. there's development, yeah. so there must be something here that is that is really holding that, that student back, an existing an existing habit. So he actually had me uh, suggested that I have the student um, do deep knee bends while um, playing up and down, hmm. up and down. And I said deep knee bends, and he says yes because the while the oh, okay. while the uh, student is doing deep knee bends. The brain is going to be very, very preoccupied with these very large muscle groups, and there's mm -hmm. not going to be a lot of, a lot of room left or, mm -hmm. or um, opportunity left for the for the mind to really stay in the old habits. It's going to be distracted, in other words, and so the so the distraction of the of the large muscle group movements um, in the form of deep knee bends allowed the student to have some success in the, in the upper register. That's interesting. It was. It was completely mind blowing. I've been told to stand on one leg while I work out at something difficult. Yeah. Probably for some of the same reasons. Yeah, I mean, and then also there's a the whole neural pathway mm -hmm. thing. You know, the habits are represented by neural pathways, and and the uh, neural pathways when you take the instrument, the neural pathways that represent your instrument and you light up, and it's the good stuff and the bad stuff. You know, the good hab habits and the bad habits, the the good luggage and the bad luggage. And so when you have the instrument in your hands, those neural pathways light up. When you change something about that scenario, standing on one leg, deep knee bands, maybe just standing or sitting a little bit in a little bit different way. Becker wouldn't like that. Well, I mean, not as a not <laughs> not a habitual, yeah, not habitual. Okay. But just to just to break through, and it's something that'll change change the equation in, in the mind. That makes that helps the the neural pathways to go a little bit darker, mm -hmm. that you know representing that that difficult habit, and so then you can sneak in around do an end round, and you can sneak in some something new that can then be developed into a new habit that would eventually replace the old one. Awesome. Um, I I'm also curious uh, about what inspired you in the first place to start to the People TV. It was really quite by accident. Um, I had intended on, I had embarked on a completely different project, and um, I thought, well, it'd be nice to have uh, maybe get some friends who studied with Jacobs just to come in and, and talk about their experiences with Mr. Jacobs. So, but I was doing something over here. This was a project over here, and then I had as an add-on the Jacobs thing. Oh. After my after interviewing Becker, you know, Mike for the first time, and then Bruce Bryany and Charlie Shook it. Uh, I thought, this is this is way more interesting than what I'm doing over here. So I just completely dropped that and just started to focus on on the, on the Tube of People TV. And initially, I was trying to keep it within 10 to 15 minutes, just for ease of viewing and that sort of thing. But as I was going along, you know, there's just sometimes there's just a lot of information yeah. to get, and I felt like I felt like the 10 or 15 minute time limit was a was really an artificial hindrance to getting. A full amount of information yeah. from from that that person, 
Uh -huh. So I just I, did, I abandoned that as well. And so it okay. could be ten minutes, it could be an hour. You know, yeah. some of them are an hour and ten minutes. I right, guess. right. And I apologize for those of you who are <laughs> have to wade through all of them. I mean, it can be kind of lengthy. Lots of stuff there. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. But there's usually a, a a few nuggets in there that's worth you know sifting through. Oh, absolutely. It's that's the goal anyway. Yeah, I I would say that some interviews are more dense than others, but the the nuggets of of each episode are you know there's some dense stuff to really think about yeah you know spend some time thinking about yeah. so you didn't really have an agenda it was really just let's interview the person make them feel comfortable and, and talk about whatever they may wish to yeah largely right yeah I mean I have my my set of a question my set yeah. of questions you know when did you first encounter Jacobs what did you remember from your first lesson or two or three mm -hmm. You know, what did he help you with the most? What was a big fix? Mm -hmm. If he, if they studied with him over a long period of time, did you notice anything? And is, did his pedagogy change, or did it stay the same? You know, those types of things. So, do you, did do you find that there's a large common thread with everyone that you've interviewed, or is there? Well, I mean that everybody, uh -huh. every interview is different. Everybody is different, and his curriculum was individualized to the person in, in the room with him at the time. He didn't have a method. There's no Jacob's method. There's no Jacob's yeah, method. That, that's an interesting topic because I think you've said that he may have had an agenda, but he also was reacted to what he was experiencing with the student, right? Absolutely. D deliver a ge general curriculum, but... Two principles, <laughs> song and wind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and mostly song. Right. Mostly song. Wind was just the, the the mechanism. Good wind is the mechanism to making the song great. But you got to have the song first and foremost. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can have great wind, but if you have no song, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. So his his curriculum was individualized. Two principles of song and wind, and you know his goal. I, I think with each student was to help them to sound great and if you played all all wrong like if you played incorrectly quote unquote but you sounded great I mean you were making great music and you were connecting and you were communicating and he would wouldn't say a word about your wrongness mm -hmm. he was all about just sound great do it all wrong but sound great that's what he would say sure um, if somebody was if somebody was having a hard time and not sounding good, then he would go and start to help them help untangle them, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. and make them make them um, easy easier, less tense, less bound up, less tight, and that sort of thing. And then the song could really the song aspect could come out. Yeah, makes total sense to me. So what have you learned from doing all of these interviews? What I've learned from this is that he was an extremely generous person, and um, the you know I thought I knew him pretty well three dimensionally, but doing this project I've come to know him more in four dimensional view. Okay. Uh, you know I've, I've learned so much more about him uh, doing doing this project. He's such a generous person. Uh, you know he would buy tickets for students. He would buy uh, music for the student if he thought they couldn't afford it, um, he would teach them for free. Mm -hmm. You know, don't tell Gizzy, I'm teaching you for free. Uh -huh. Or he would put them on scholarship. You know, scho per his personal scholarship. Um, he was he was just a, a real regular person. He was a he was a genius. He was a genius, and I'm really proud to say he was a tuba player too. You know. <laughs> I mean, he was he was an amazing person, and um, the the amount of information that he that he collected over the course of his lifetime, you know, he had the do the knowledge of a of a doctor, and something that Brian Fredrickson said in his interview was that um, uh, you know doctors are trained to you know treat diseases. Jacobs trained himself. To deal with people, mm -hmm. in 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 their 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 psychological um, space, mm -hmm. uh, and to you know he trained himself how to um, um, 
deal with people, how to interact with people, how to reach people um, in their minds so that they felt comfortable going along on this journey with him. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, he met the student where the student was. He took the student where the student was by the hand and gently led the student, usually. That's been my, my experience in these interviews, um, to a place of greater success, greater skill, greater expression. And he did that because he knew that he had to um, um, reach them, he had to make them feel comfortable, he had to uh, speak to them as closely on their level as he could, and so that meant that he had to determine where they were. And so he would spend a lot of time in uh, lessons just talking with you to, to figure out who you were, where you, where you come mm -hmm. from, what's your background, all, this, all this, these types of things. So just a, a tremendous, generous person and uh, you know, was gregarious, fun-loving, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> not very good with repairing things, which is why he had four or five broken laundry machines in his mm -hmm. basement and uh, uh, all kinds of other, other things. Yeah, that sounds like quite the place. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have a future goal with this project? Is it culminating in something? Well, um, I, I've, I'm sort of ramping down the, the real large activity of, of, mm -hmm. of interviews. Um, I've got about 100 now. And so t in my mind, that, I think that is a good number. I'm not going to stop interviewing. I'm just not going to be as active in mm -hmm. going out and, and interviewing. I think that's also been a, a real key to the success is going to people. Right. It, it's sort of emblematic of Jacobs going to where the student was in terms of, you know, where they were emotionally, um, psychologically, and um, it would have been certainly much easier, much less expensive to do it via uh, the web. Yeah. Um, but then you know puddles wouldn't have been able to be next to the person. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to give you, you know, such a nice gift. Uh -huh. You know, all that kind of stuff. So, it's uh, it's it's nice to go to people and it also has given me a chance to really reconnect with people I haven't seen in 25 or 30 years mm -hmm. and it's also given me a chance to meet new new friends uh, which has been really really terrific so the next step is to try and really get the nuggets pan the nuggets out of all this information uh, leave leave certainly leave the full-length interviews up as they are but then develop um, a new more um, uh, uh, specific, organized, systematized, a way to access uh, those, okay. those those nuggets of information I more see. quickly, uh, so so you don't have to spend your, half your day to get them. <laughs> and along that way, there might be some sort of a uh, a book that would that would go to help you know just cool. the two the two the two together. Because as one of my advisors says, some people watch your videos. Some people read books. Uh, you know, yeah. some people don't do both. Some people do both. Some people don't do both. So you you wanna you wanna be accessible um, to more people. Great. Yeah. You must remember your first lesson experience with Jacobs. Could you yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. That? I mean, after that civic, that ten minute civic audition, which was a lesson, a mini lesson. Uh, my first lesson. Um, you know, just came in there and he was explaining various things about respiration and, and uh, wind at the lips and, and I, just, I just went into this, this uh, uh, it was one of those things that you see in the movies, you know, where the, the person who's talking to you, their voice fades and you, you hear the person talking to themselves in their, in their mind, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, just, they're having this conversation while the other person's continuing to converse with them. And, and I just got this big grin on my face because what I was thinking was, this isn't hard. It's easy after all. Uh -huh. it's, this is amazing. I got this big smile on my face and Mr. Jacobs thought I was, I was laughing at him. He got really terse with me. He said, you think I'm joking, but I'm not. This is not, this is not I'm not being funny here. Uh -huh. And I had, oh, no, Mr. Jacobs, no, no, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to say that you were, no. I, it was, what I meant, what I was thinking was, this is much easier than it had been, and you're ex you're showing me a way that is much easier than I've experienced. Did he believe you then? He did. <laughs> he did. Okay. But uh, you know, certainly, uh, just breathing more deeply. Certainly. Mm -hmm. 
be more relaxed, you know. Um, he would often um, be palpating my my abdominal area to see if it was tight because I, I right. my existing habits were to to bear down, mm -hmm. you know, to make my my abdominal wall very very tight as if I were um, you know defecating or something like that or getting ready to be punched. Yeah. And um, so he was always for a while there. He was often often just palpating there to see what was going on, see if it was stiff or if it was. If it was malleable, if it was moving. He must have seen a lot of tight gut then. Oh yeah, oh of course. I mean that was prevailing pedagogy, yeah. absolutely tight gut. So um, he wanted to make sure that it was it was um, um, moving and not not firm. No rigidity. Because rigidity. you got to if you're going to have air movement, you have to have shape change. Right. You can't have air movement without shape change. Mm -hmm. So he was encouraging me to, to he was giving me permission to change my shape. You know to. To, to get bigger, that's right. That sort of thing, instead of the uh -huh. that I had been that I was had encountered prior. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. So things of that nature, buzzing the mouthpiece, of course, uh, singing, you know. And before I went to him, when I would look at a piece of music, I didn't hear anything in my mind. I didn't hear notes. I didn't hear pitches. I saw ink spots on the page. And uh -huh. when I went to him, he he got me to um, think more in terms of sounds in the mind and to s singing more with a voice with the, with the lips and to really start to contemplate and ponder sounds quality of sounds um, mm -hmm. as well as you know just phrasing stuff but it was the it was the actual live sound in the mind that that so an ink out. spot just not a valve combination an ink spot not a valve combination yeah. or when I was a trombonist a, a slight position mm -hmm. yeah Oh, very interesting. Thanks or when I was a percussionist, a, a paradiddle or a flam. Hmm. Yeah. Very good. So that was that was basically uh, uh, an, uh, among my first first several lessons was just getting to be more relaxed, more loose, deep, more breathe, breathing deeply, mm -hmm. playing with a mouthpiece, you know, buzzing a mouthpiece, and and uh, being more of a more of a storyteller, an actor, mm -hmm. just make statements instead of ask questions. Very good. You are obviously very passionate about Arnold Jacobs mm -hmm. and his teachings. There must be something that um, fascinates you about him. I think I'm so passionate because he quite literally literally changed my life. Um, and, you know, he, I didn't know who he was when I applied to get into his studio. I mean, it wasn't his studio at the very moment that I applied, but it became his studio again, well, you know, when I got there. And, um, just uh, his approach uh, was so was so simple. It was you know simple commands. Um, you know, don't think in complex thoughts when you're thinking about when you're interfacing with the body and the the movements and the the, the things that you need to get the body to do. Keep it simple. The whole control panel of the car, you know, rather than getting under the hood and mm -hmm. and trying to trying to drive the car from from underneath the hood, you know, just use the simple controls that that were given to you by the car car manufacturers. So the same the same thing. I think um, you know what was really amazing to me was he took um, a, a lesson uh, in a completely a 180 a direction because. Prior to Jacobs, when you went in to see a teacher for a private lesson, it was do as I say because this is what the, this is what works for me. And with Jacobs, it was do as I say because this is what works for people. And so, it's you know what he's talking about are really, in many respects, universal truths. Mm -hmm. And that makes me very excited because it's not just well you have to fit in a certain parameter for this advice to work for you. Mm -hmm. The only parameter you have to fit into is being a reasonably healthy human being. Mm -hmm. And what he has to say will then be applicable to you. Um, and it's, it's uh, certainly, you know, that's the case with the physical. It's also the case with the, the psychological. The psychological is a lot more, that's a lot more complex and and how to deal with people's psyches um, in a lesson situation. Mm -hmm. uh, because there, there is ordinarily, there's a lot of experience that comes in through the door 
some of it positive experience and some of it negative experience when related to the musical engagement, mm -hmm. you know, the interaction with the instrument. So I think the thing that just made me so excited, has made me so excited, so passionate, I, and I remember this, I remember driving to, uh, on vacation with my dad the summer of 1982, so a year after my first year, and playing for him in the car Arnold Jacobs masterclass tapes from Northwestern University and saying, isn't this amazing? Hmm. Isn't this amazing? You know, and he's a social studies teacher. You know, he wasn't a musician. He's not, he's not a musician. And, and uh, you know, of course, he was very supportive and that sort of thing. But I was so excited that this was it. Mm -hmm. This was amazing. It was, and I just have to spread the good news. I call it the, the gospel of Jake. Right. You know, the gospel according to Jacobs is, uh, is, is, it's, to me, very exciting. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian also, and so I have a, the gospel according to Christ, and, the, and as a musician, I have the gospel according to Jacobs. And uh, uh, those two things are, to me, very, very exciting. Sure, sure. Now, obviously, Mr. Jacobs has been gone for 18 years, right? Yeah. Um, and there are so many of us out there, myself included, who never had the chance to meet Mr. Jacobs. Um, and this project, TPTV, obviously is allowing um, younger people to become familiar with him. And of course, there are resources out there that books that you can get to do the same thing. But I think it's wonderful that it's, you know, like you say, proclaiming the gospel of Jake to a younger audience as well. Right. Um, why may it, why is it uh, important for a young person to be familiar with Jacobs? I think there's two levels there. I think the first level is, is it's not necessarily important that they, they know who Jacobs was. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, prim, it's primarily important for them to know what he taught. I think it, secondarily, it would be great for them to know who Jacobs was so they, they could learn more about him and get, get more into what he was about. But I think as a prime, the, I, would, I would not waste two ounces of breath telling a student about Mr. Jacobs in the absence of what he was, what he taught, I see. And, and what he what he was trying to trying to get across, sure. Um, because that would be an old guy telling old stories about an old hero, and we all know how that turns out. Not so well. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'd like to be that old guy who continues to spread the good news, according to Jacobs. And when I say that, he, you know, let me just be clear. He was not. He was not infallible. He was a fallible human being, and um, a lot of, of uh, uh, you know times you can you can deify a person and put him on a pedestal. I certainly do hold him in very very high regard. I, I do think he was his was correct in in most of the situations that he realms that he entered, mm -hmm. but there's certainly room for discussion. On any on anything, mm -hmm. I just happen to think that um, physiologically, biologically, biologically, and psychologically, we're gonna. F he was he was right, and there were there were so many people that he helped throughout the decades. You know, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. You know that I I think the 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 body the weight of the body of evidence is, I mean, just it's just. Like that ba bag that Mike Becker talks about in his very camp. present. You know, it's a big bag of evidence, <laughs> and uh, it's hard to. It's it's. I mean, you can refute it and you can argue it, and I that's fine. Uh, I'm I, I'm certainly an apologist for Mr. Jacobs. You know, I make his arguments to the best of my ability. There are others out there today that I think are even better, perhaps a lot better than I am in terms of making arguments as an apologist for Mr. Mr. Jacobs' effectiveness. Hmm. Um, but um, I just want to want to be clear that that uh, you know he was just a guy. Um, he was a very impressive guy, a world-class musician with amazing uh, research to his credit, um, amazing body of knowledge in his mind, and an amazing intellect that was able to put all of that together into the studio and, and help mm -hmm. help change um, the world of music for the better. I asked uh, Henry Fogel once, mm -hmm. I was in an elevator with him one time, and 
I, I said, I have a theory, maybe it's even as strong as a theorem, that Arnold Jacobs and Bud Herseth changed classical music, the world of classical music. And the, 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 the way it goes is, you know, they had the CSO as the bully, the bully pulpit, they had a great recording contract, they had Fritz Reiner in the 50s, they had George Schulte in the 70s and 80s, and they, they had made these recordings, these recordings would go around the world, and uh, Jacobs uh, and Herseth would be heard in this great brass section. People would come to Chicago and try and get some of that magic, some of that secret sauce. Mm -hmm. They would mostly go study with, with Jacobs. A few people would study with, with Mr. Herseth. He didn't teach as much. Right. Um, they would then go back and share what they had with their students, and their students would then eventually come and get it directly from the, from the people, you know, from Jacobs. And then they would go back, and they would give it to their students, and then those students would come back to get it directly from Mr. Jacobs, and then they would go back. So you had this going on for decades and decades and decades and decades. And this then spread throughout the world and uh, really has affected um, the world of, of not just classical music, but you, know, you look at somebody like, like, like Lou Soloff. I mean, he was coming to study with Jacobs monthly mm -hmm. when he was in Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and people, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. And uh, in that elevator ride, I, I made that, made that, uh, um, gave that prospectus to uh, Mr. Vogel, cocked his head, and he said, I think you have something there. Mm -hmm. I think you might be right. And uh, so I really, I mean, it's just an exciting thing to me to uh, uh, think about what Bert, Mr. Herseth and Mr. Jacobs did in that just a magical time with the Chicago Symphony, um, not only for orchestral music, but for music uh, music in general, and it was, I think it was really the perfect storm mm -hmm. of many confluences coming together um, on Michigan Avenue, which is right behind us. Yeah. So, hey, Joe, Puddles has uh, asked me if you would be willing to uh, accept this uh, genuine Tuba People TV water bottle with our thanks. Would you be willing to do that? Gladly. And we thank you so it. much for uh, for uh, watching every single episode. Oh my Absolutely. goodness! Absolutely, I love this stuff. That's amazing. Appreciate it very much. Always a pleasure to be with you. Likewise. Thank you. And now back to you. <laughs>